Hello, my name is Jorge Samanillo. Welcome to History Miami Museum. Buenas tardes, ¿cómo están? Today, I'm honored to have a great panel here of Pedro Pans and Victor Triay, our great historian, is going to moderate the panel for us. Uh, thank you for coming out. We have, we're honored to have this exhibit up for the open in June. Operation Pedro Pan has been a great success for us. It's a great story, as all of you can know that already. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance, please go upstairs after the panel and visit. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, it really is. Um, I want to get started with oh, one more housekeeping. Please, please silence your cell phones. Mine is on also. Because uh, there's always one that goes off in the middle of the panel, and we are recording this, so it would be nice to have a clean interview. I want to start by introducing Victor Triay. Dr. Victor Triay is a Cuban-American historian and novelist specializing in Cuban exile topics. The Miami Herald referred to him as a significant researcher of Cuban exile history. Born in Miami, he is known for the books Fleeing Castro, Operation Pedro Pan, and the Cuban Children's Program, and Bay of Pigs, an oral history of Brigade 2506, for which he was awarded the Samuel Proctor History Prize by the Florida Historical Society in 2001. Currently, Dr. Triay is a history professor at Middlesex Community College. So let me pass it on to him, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much. It, is a, it truly is a great honor to be here. I love getting together with the uh, Pedro Pan uh, group. I'm very honored to be on such a distinguished panel who I'll be introducing uh, any second now uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, but I'm very happy to be here. I'm very glad to be here. Always glad to be at these events. Um, I, I was asked to give a brief history of the program before we got started um, with the questions for the panel. So let me try to do it in, I was told in five minutes. I don't know how I could possibly do it in, in five minutes, but I think there's a lot I, I, I don't need to go over, uh, especially with this group. But as many of you know, 1959 in Cuba began with great joy and great hope. A new democratic era had been born, supposedly, but we know by the, by the spring of 1959, uh, there were already a number of suspicions that perhaps this revolution wasn't democratic after all, that perhaps that was just a smokescreen uh, for a communist subversion, I guess is the only word uh, to use or the only term to use. Uh, I often say it was uh, communism coming into Cuba aboard a democratic Trojan horse, right? The gates were opened and in came the gift and then next thing you know it was about something else. Um, oh, sir? Oh, okay. I was wondering, so, all right, anyway. <laughs> so anyway, um, you can hear me twice. Uh, definitely early signs of, of, of communist indoctrination in the rebel army, communists receiving positions of power within the government, which made everybody suspicious. And then before the end of the year, a few months before the end of the year, some of Castro's own rebel commanders, Lou Matos, who we were talking about just, uh, just a few minutes ago, already questioning Castro and receiving a 20-year sentence. By 1960, it was clear that this was not what it was meant to be. In early 1960, Anastas Mikoyan visited Cuba. We know the trade agreements that followed, the diplomatic recognition, and out very soon throughout the rest of the year was the, was the free press, whether it was the newspapers, television, uh, radio, the University of uh, Havana lost its autonomy. Uh, during the summer of 1960, and also during 1960, we see the creation uh, of the militia, of the Committees for the Defense of the Revolution, the block-by-block -block watchdog groups, uh, the, the radicalized youth organizations and the other mass organizations, all telltale signs of communism and totalitarianism uh, now beginning to emerge. Um, by October of that year, there were a number of interventions, of, of takeovers of private businesses, including banks, and other industries, and by this point, it was, it was very clear that, that the institutions of Cuba, the free institutions, the independent institutions were all uh, disappearing, whether they were professional organizations or whatever it was, either in, in, a, in, a, in a classical style, either being shut down by the government or forced to adapt a new ideology that was in line uh, with what the government was teaching. Um, of course, in early 1961, uh, diplomatic relations were broken between the United States and Cuba, and all leading to the great moment in the spring of 1961 where everything 
uh, just kind of happened at the same time. Uh, Castro, finally, after years of denying communist ties, uh, admitted that he was, or said that he was a socialist later in the year. He'll use the term Marxist-Leninist. Uh, almost at the same time, the Bay of Pigs invasion occurred, which failed. At the same time, roughly, the last bastion for many parents to protect their children from the growing radicalism on the island, from the, from the growing totalitarianism on the island, which were the private schools, were shut down, all happening at almost the same time. And of course, already, for months, there had been emigration from Cuba, many people seeing the writing on the wall and beginning to leave, either entire families or parts of families, and of course, the number of people leaving after the spring of 1961, well, the number skyrocketed, as, as, as many of you know. But, you know, we're here to address uh, this program. Um, I, I think the most important thing is that there were people, there was a giant exodus from Cuba, period. Um, things that are going to drive entire families out, uh, the, the growing radicalization, the seizure of private property, uh, the closing of the private schools, the... Uh, and, and, and it wasn't just closing the schools, but it was they're going to open a new school system uh, whose goal it was going to be to create the communist new man and new woman. And there was a, a sense among parents that they were going to lose control uh, over their children, over their upbringing, over how they were going to raise them. And, and, and at the same time, getting the message that the values that we've taught them and the values that we want to teach them are no longer acceptable here. And now we have to let them go and, and be indoctrinated with these values that we find offensive. There was also a threat of a military draft, which I think is something that's a little bit underemphasized, how important the rumors of that draft were, uh, that they were going to start drafting children or boys as young as 15 or 16 into the military, which would, of course, take these boys away from their parents, put them into a radicalized environment of the military, and possibly send them overseas to fight wars in the name of an ideology that the parents found abhorrent. Uh, and, and that was a very important factor. A disproportionate number of the, of, the, of the kids who came on Operation Pedro Pan were teenage boys. Uh, they, they were, there was a disproportionate number of them. But the program started, I mean, keep in mind that entire families were leaving driven by these things. You know, people who didn't want their children to go to the schools, uh, people who were afraid that they were going to lose control over their lives, picked up and left. Uh, a lot of the Pedro Pan children were people who had the opportunity to send their children. The parents, for one reason or another, couldn't leave, but they had the chance to do it with these, with these special visa waivers. Um, that whole process got started. Um, by November 1960, there were all, already signs that unaccompanied children might be arriving. Father Brian Walsh of the, of the Catholic Welfare Bureau met a teenage boy who had been sent by himself. He created a contingency plan uh, just in case more showed up, not only with his own Catholic Welfare Bureau, but with other similar bureaus from other faiths. When the federal government sent in a representative to check out the situation in Miami from the Eisenhower administration, they proposed this plan to him, they got the okay, as long as enough kids showed up that the private agencies couldn't handle it anymore. Not long after that, James Baker, the headmaster of Ruston Academy, showed up in Miami. Baker and, and, and other Ruston families were involved with the underground, and it was when the underground was really growing and, we're, and everything was going uh, toward the invasion. But a lot of people said, I won't serve in the underground if my kids are not safe. Because they had stories of the Spanish Civil War, of how they used to take uh, you know, people's children to, to, to bring them out of hiding, etc. So Baker came with the idea of establishing maybe a boarding school for the children of underground operatives in Cuba. Um, he met Monsignor Walsh and, and others, not just children of underground operatives, but, but anybody who, who wanted to send their child and establish a boarding school. He met Father Walsh. Father Walsh said, don't worry, uh, we have a system already. If you bring the kids and then, you know, we'll, we'll take care of them. And they agreed to work together to get the paperwork to bring them over. The embassy was still open. The embassy closes in January 1961. Uh, Baker created a committee in Cuba to keep the exodus going. The committee... Um, which included uh, certain Rustin families, the Higuels, the Finlays, Penny Powers, had connections to KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, uh, the Dutch Embassy, and the British Embassy. So they devised a scheme to get uh, visas for the children to travel to Jamaica. And then once they were in Jamaica, they could get their US visas and come to the United States. The State Department had to approve it. Uh, Baker was already here after they closed the embassy. They approved it. And also, the United States did something tremendous exceptional, never done before, and that was to bend the immigration laws to a very high degree. The United States, when, 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 when 
relations were broken. The, the diplomats at the U.S. Embassy and U.S. consuls were issuing visas for travel to the U.S. like crazy. There, was, there were no restrictions. Now they couldn't do that anymore. And there was something called the visa waiver, which was supposed to be used in extreme cases, case-by-case -case basis. They were supposed to be rarely used, and the U.S. government allowed for visa waivers to be issued to Cubans. As long as you had someone in the United States to request one for you in Cuba, the United States was issuing them by the thousands. Uh, I, I believe they issued 400,000 before 1962. These which were supposed to be used in extreme cases of need, but the U.S. government just said, just, just send them, and, and, and they did. Within, and while that was starting, Walsh had gone to Washington to talk about the Jamaica plan with the State Department. They said fine, as long as uh, the British approved, which they did. But they also offered this use of visa waivers, but not the regular visa waivers. They allowed Father Walsh to be the one to request visa waivers, because to get a visa waiver, you had to have somebody in the United States to request one on your behalf. And then you had to apply, and it took a little bit of time. They kind of created a shortcut for, for Father Walsh to say, you could request a visa waiver for any child between uh, 6 and 16 and 17 and 18 with a security clearance. Um, and, and they allowed him not only to, to petition for those, but even to send the visa waivers himself on Catholic Welfare Bureau letterhead. And of course, it was approved, these visa waivers, Walsh told me he sent maybe a dozen visa waivers into Cuba of the special ones for children, which allowed him, which were already there. They didn't have to have someone in the United States to ask for one, they were already existed. The underground mass produced them, and of course, they were distributed all over Cuba, and hence, you know, the, the, the program continued. Of course, a lot of you know, once the children got here, about half of them had relatives, um, and they went with those relatives. The other half entered what they, what they called the Cuban Children's Program, which eventually became part of the general Cuban refugee program. At first, it started out a little bit independent, but when President Kennedy created the Cuban, the Cuban refugee program, it was incorporated as part of that, which, which secured funding. As a lot of you know, they eventually established three transit centers in Miami, more commonly called camps, uh, but there were more transit centers where the children without relatives were taken. They would have liked to have housed them there in Miami, but they couldn't because more and more children kept showing up. So Father Walsh had to create a network uh, across the country with, uh, in, in, in 35 different states with Catholic dioceses uh, to provide foster homes, uh, boarding schools, group homes where they could send Cuban children with, 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 with exiled Cuban clergy, etc. They placed as many children as they could in the Miami area, but the Miami area wasn't that big. And of course, this endured the Cuban Children's Program for a very long time. The numbers dropped in October 1962 when the Cuban Missile Crisis came and all commercial flights between the United States and Cuba ended. And of course, the number of kids in undercare was reduced but there were a lot of parents who were separated from their children at this point, and there were no commercial flights. It, 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 as far as I know, all the immigration until 1962 was on regular commercial flights. There wasn't a special airlift, a refugee airlift like you saw during the Freedom Flights. It was just whatever commercial flights were available. And with the end of that, a lot of them ended up separated for a much longer time until the initiation of the Freedom Flights when a lot of those parents uh, were, were able to come to the United States and reunite uh, with their children. But a, a total of about half of the 14,000 uh, entered the Cuban Children's Program, and the Cuban Children's Program continued. Um, of course, once the first round of reunions were, well, I mean, first of all, they stopped sending kids away from Miami once the flight stopped, because they didn't have that pressure anymore to send the kids elsewhere. Uh, and then when the parents started, and so the number when kids turned 18 was reduced, when the parents came it was reduced more, and eventually the Cuban Children's Program left those first facilities and migrated to different parts depending on the number of kids. But the Cuban Children's Program continued to accept unaccompanied Cuban minors until 1981, uh, until it you know, finally closed its doors. Um, and there were a lot of people who came in in 1963, in 1965, in 1968, uh, which were taken care of. And there were three agencies, there was Monsignor Walsh's Catholic Welfare Bureau, and then a Protestant agency and Jewish agencies, and the children were placed uh, with whatever agency uh, matched their faith. So, I think I got it all, um, in a nutshell. <laughs> if I forgot anything, you can tell me during the question and answer session.